Hello, Internet. This is Makers on Tap. The are a new podcast started by RCL River City Labs here in Peoria, Illinois. Just trying to talk about random making things and the maker culture out there. Uh, my name is Christian. I am joined by two gentlemen, Joe and Aaron, tonight. Uh, what is everyone drinking on tap tonight? I have got that vodka and Coke Zero fresh off the tap. <laughs> <laughs> if only. I am. Uh, I'm drinking a stout called Ice Stout from Eight Wired Brewing Company in New Zealand. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty great. Hell yeah. Uh, I am drinking a hard cider cherry mead called Zombie Killer by Bee Nectar Company. Uh, and I'm going to get messed up tonight. <laughs> oh, man. So, I am that way place... ahead of you, bro. <laughs> that place is right next to a makerspace in Detroit. They, they actually share a building with I3. Are they really? Yeah, I, I found that out as I was walking out of I3, and they were closing, and I was mad. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, like, ever since I've gotten on this one, I've just, like, can't drink anything else. It's incredible. Hmm. Um, but let's go ahead, and uh, we're going to jump into some topics tonight. We have a couple things that we wanted to chat about, and we are just kind of mowing over um, beforehand. And so we're going to dive into a couple of those, uh, one of which is uh, the main topic we want to cover is failure um, and what that means for most people and what that kind of goes into. And I'm actually going to kind of spark one of the first segments, uh, kind of a little a nice icebreaker for uh, you to get to know each one of us and for us to be able to kind of talk about some past stuff that's happened uh, and maybe some cool stuff that we're all thinking about making and we're working on. Um, and so first thing I want to go and talk about is something that actually happened to me today. Um, we're going to pretend like the last podcast might not ever hit the light of day. Uh, and so <laughs> I have a, <laughs> I have a crazy job. Um, and I encounter a lot of weird things in my job, um, from various, uh, just random electrical things to random programming things because I have my hands on a lot of things. Um, and so one of the things that I ran into today was I had a uh, masking motor blow up on me. Um, and this is a simple just uh, servo motor that's turning a chain and it moves the masking from one end of the screen to the other. Uh, and what happened was, was the uh, a lightning actually hit it, hit the fuse, and blew it up. Um, it hit and the it, fuse directly? Yeah. Just lightning it's, bolt straight to the fuse? Yeah. Let me. I'm actually going to send a picture what? of it in, uh, in chat. So I was waiting for this so I could actually get your guys' general reactions. Um, so the masking is just the stuff on the sides of the movie screen that come in when the movie starts? Yes. Give it that. So that is... That is the curtains that move in. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that kind of I wanted to chat about was uh, what is something of yours that has gotten ruined by unforeseen circumstances? Um, Lord. So I'll go ahead uh, and start this off because I, I know that's an interesting question right off the bat and it's kind of something to heavy to think about. Um, and so the first thing that comes to mind for me um, is funny enough, we talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, my arcade, um, uh, my arcade, I built this beer cade that was a full six foot standing arcade cabinet with a kegerator in the bottom of it. Um, and it was really, really fun to build. Um, there was a lot of challenges in building it. Um, but one of the things that happened right away was as we were taking it to the event to get shown off, uh, and we were getting it prepped that day uh, at the convention center. We literally loaded it up. I sat in the back with it. And I had my hand on the cabinet <laughs> so it wouldn't move. But what I didn't realize is somebody was trying to be helpful. And because of that, they put the CO2 tank in the cabinet to try and make it easy for me to like haul it with it. I was not aware that the CO2 tank was in the cabinet and so i was not trying to protect it 
So the guy who was taking us to the convention center, he was getting us all ready. He takes a corner. The door to the kegerator flies open. The CO2 tank flies to the ground of the bed or the bed of the truck and just starts buzzing around and it's going crazy. And I, I am certain this is it for me. I'm, I'm dead. Like this is, I am about to die from an exploding CO2 canister. And so I jump out of the bed of the truck to try and like get clear of this whole thing. And the guy who's driving the truck just sees CO2 smoke fluming from the back of the truck and being like, just has no idea what's just happened. And he's like freaking out. So he slams the brake on the truck, jumps out and starts running across the street. And now eventually the CO2 dies down and it comes to, uh, it comes to a point where everything's now kind of calmed down. And, um, it just so happened that that event was over the weekend. And so I was not able to get CO2 and I actually had to go to a pump system like those old, uh, kegs that you would find on a college campus. And so that was something that there was no way I could have actually been able to prevent that. Um, it was just something that happened, ha happenstance, and it was a crazy coincidence that it all did happen. And so that's not a little icebreaker for myself, and I wanted to get your guys' opinions on uh, or thoughts on what is something crazy that has happened to you that you never could have predicted that might have affected a project way to put us on the spot yeah uh, I I we should really send these questions out ahead of time because <laughs> drunk drunk Aaron is drawing a huge blank <laughs> <laughs> well you know uh, there was this one time that we started to try to do a podcast and uh, the guy that was setting the topics just threw a random curveball and everything failed because of it so I'm looking at this fuse um, that you sent, and was that fuse clear at one point? Uh, yeah, no, it was clear with a nice little thin wire running through it. Because <laughs> it's definitely not clear anymore. It's very uh, carbon. Uh, so, yeah, so is the motor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that actually reminds me of a really funny time... Uh, Back before I did all the things that I do now, uh, I was a car audio installer and I built competition car audio systems. Um, and for those of you that don't know what that means, I put really large speakers into very large boxes into very small cars to see how loud we could make them. And uh, you know, part of that is putting a whole lot of power into those speakers. And I had this amp that was um, known to be uh, experimental, maybe. Um, it, it put out way more power than it was rated for. Nobody actually knew how much power you could get out of it. And uh, we were pushing this thing as hard as we possibly could. And then all of a sudden, the sound just cut. And we are like, all right, what blew? So we're digging through the stereo, the fuse up by the battery is good, the wires are all good, the speakers feel good, and I pull the amp out, and all of the fuses on the amp are melted. They, they melted the casing, and they blew, but they also refused and welded themselves back together, and then blew again. Um, so it wow. was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. Safe to say that amp didn't work very well after that, but it was <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Oh man, Aaron, do you do you have any thoughts? I did think of something. Okay. So, uh, for those who aren't aware, I'm a brand new parent, and you know, the whole nine months leading up to the delivery, everybody's like, "Oh, you know, you're gonna lose so much sleep. Get it while you can." And I'm like. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll sleep, all right. But then I have all these other projects lined up, and uh, one thing that I was working on last year was a scalable self-watering bucket garden, and I had plans to scale it up and make a version two of it this year. And right around the time when you should start a garden was when we had our first child. And I was like, oh, no problem. I've got mostly ready, and 
but then uh, the baby came and holy cow did not realize they weren't they weren't kidding how much sleep you do not get <laughs> <laughs> you know it was like ha ha get your sleep while you can i'm like ha ha yeah i will all right but it's like holy cow no sleep and so it doesn't really fall on the unforeseen thing it's more like i didn't anticipate the scale of how much sleep i would not get so i now have a good I don't know, like 18 buckets sitting behind me ready to go for next year <laughs> to start a larger garden. Well, and it doesn't take a lot of sleep to really derail everything. So, yeah. I, I'm surprised, like, you know, before we had the, the baby, you know, it'd be like 9 o'clock and be like, wow, I'm tired. I should go to bed. And now it's like, I didn't realize how much I could do without with so little sleep. <laughs> like it's really pushing my boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So are the, are you guys working on any obviously Aaron's uh you know not cuz he's not sleeping apparently, but are you guys working <laughs> on anything really cool right now? Uh, I think for me, I've got two projects that I'm currently um, heading towards. Um, I'm trying to do a full uh, pool table style, uh, not size, style, uh, D&D and gaming table. And so I want to have a uh, TV screen in the middle of it. It's going to have a 32 inch so I can have maps on that and be able to support all that kind of stuff. But it's also going to have plexiglass over all of that. So we can play card games. We can do dice games, like all that kind of stuff. It'll be contained in there. Um, I think that's my really big one that I'm shooting for. The one that I might get done sooner than that is I'm wanting to build a collect, uh, collectibles cabinet, um, for my Gundams and my roommates Gundams. So that we can have this giant cabinet that will be able to house all of them. Uh, but the cool thing that I want to do with that was I wanted to have the background to it be laser cut um, to look like a star map like, uh, Joe, you did for your engagement present. Uh, or not engagement, uh, anniversary present. Um, and so I wanted to do that with some hue lights behind it so I can have like the lights kind of change and flow into other colors and have this cool kind of galaxy background for all these Gundams. So those are the two kind of that I'm shooting for right now. Boy, you, you kept asking about that star map thing, but you didn't tell me what it was for. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it actually. <laughs> It's, uh, if I can get the motivation, not the motivation, I really want to do it. If I can get the time to do it, um, I think it'll be something awesome that I'll eventually be able to have, uh, displayed with for everything. And yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> oh man. How about you, man? Um, what are you, what are you shooting for right now? I, I last week you kind of talked a little bit about the. Uh, mill that you're working on you might have gotten parts by now didn't you or have you uh yeah um so i'm in like the finishing stages of a whole bunch of things and uh, that means i want to start a whole bunch of new things um but uh yeah yesterday i got um all of these uh panel mount port connectors so i can uh, not have wires hanging out of the back of this thing. So I, I've got this little uh, CNC mill that was from, I think, 1995. Uh, the software was supposed to run on Windows 98. Uh, so um, I guess those two don't go don't coincide. Uh, it was Windows 95 or 98. Anyway, um, I've had it for like three years and... Uh, about every six or seven months or so I spend about three hours working on it and, you know, get a little bit farther and a little bit farther. And a couple of weeks ago I, uh, spent a little bit more time with it and it's now running the newest update of Gerbil, which is a, um, USB serial based, uh, CNC control system that runs on like an Arduino Uno. 
Uh, this is using a CNC specific board that has an Arduino Pro in it, which was a huge pain all in itself because there's no documentation anywhere for it. So I'm working on fixing that. And um, the Pro barely fits it too. Yeah, it barely, just barely. Like but 94% utilization. It's gotten a lot better though. Uh, with 1.1F, they knocked a whole bunch of stuff out. So um, yeah, you might want to look at that because uh, I, I think it was closer to like 78 when I compiled it. Oh, nice. Um, but then, um, so yeah, so that it, it works really well now compared to um, when it worked a year and a half ago when I was uh, spending a lot of time with it and I just wanted to put the whole thing in a dumpster and set it on fire. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've got tool touch tool probing working on it it homes right now and it, just a whole bunch of little things like um that were undocumented like if you want the home switches to work right you have to put a capacitor in line with them because the board just doesn't work without them <laughs> it, little things that should have been that should be a uh, stock on a board that you buy but you know they're not so you have to right. add them in line and there's no documentation um and uh so yeah it's it's coming together and um it's got a standalone raspberry pi in it now so now it's just you hook a monitor up to it and i've got a wireless keyboard and it's a little self-contained cnc station um and it, it's it's pretty neat it's very small i think it's got a two inch by eight inch by six inch work area so i have no idea what i'll ever make in it because everything i make's big um but yeah it's a it's been a fun project and um, we take it around to like events and stuff when it's working and, and show kids about CNC things and everyone goes, that's a weird looking 3d printer. And then I get to explain how not everything that moves on its own is a 3d printer. And, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty great time. You're using a BCNC still with that, right? Yeah. So I'm using BCNC for the control software. Um, I am using fusion 360 for the cam, uh, because, the adaptive machining allows you to take a very light duty machine like this and actually accomplish things with it. Um, if there's a couple new uh, cam softwares uh, that are, are dropping in beta right now that I want to play with a little bit, um, OpenDesk just dropped their uh, cloud based cam that I, it seems interesting. I don't know if it's going to be good, but um I want to play with it a little bit and it'd be nice to be able to do like everything right on the pie. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see how well that will work. I don't have high expectations um, because I have very high expectations of how machines should work. So I don't have expectations that this will work to my expectations. So many expectations. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is you are a, a huge fan of JavaScript running your high performance machines as a form of CNC JS. I, I didn't say that at all. I, I, I said, I hate it. I hate everything about it. <laughs> it terrifies me. But JavaScript um, runs all of our best stuff in the world. So for those that you can't see, there's sarcasm dripping off of those words. It's oozing out of my words. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, this has been a really fun experiment. Um, all of my machines up until this have been based around Linux CNC or Mach 3 or some sort of very powerful CNC specific system. And uh, this has been a neat idea to go through. And my whole CNC control system is less than $100 in this entire thing. So um, that's very different from the world of like building up a CNC controller that was six or $700 for my CNC router um, and having to find specific PCs to run it and having to use all this very specific software and kernel modules and the barrier to entry is very high for those systems. So I'm, I'm excited that the functionality is getting better in these. Um, I'm still scared of them because they don't stop when I tell them to and cutting tools. Anyway, <laughs> I am, 
yeah, I am glad you're a fan of Gerbil now, at least for the current version. Because yeah, ha- needing to find fan a specific, is strong. <laughs> needing to find a specific computer that can run Linux CNC well is very hard. And being able, to, it's like Gerbil, you can just run it on an Arduino. So it's like super accessible for anyone. So I'm glad that it's making good strides. Yeah, to I, better. I'm tolerant of Gerbil now. Is the <laughs> right way to say it. <laughs> Yeah, but as far as uh, my projects, I've got a couple in the pipeline that I'm currently working on. Um, let's see. Besides our current, uh, we're we're working on moving the makerspace. So as a director, that's kind of like my main focus. But I have a couple personal projects that I'm working on. Um, one of them being a new motorized uh, Z table for our Chinese laser cutter. We have a K40 style laser cutter at our outer makerspace. It had a, a previously a custom motorized Z table that worked for a good year or so, but recently kind of crapped out. So instead of buying one that we looked at the light object Z table, which is a commercially available motorized table, which will allow you to kind of um, those who aren't aware, it, you can you can focus your material to the specific laser focus distance based on your material height. Um, and that's what it's for. Um, you can, we could buy that, but they're out of stock. And so it kind of leaves us up. Well, we could, you know, buy it from some random person who has one available as a kit, or we could just make our own. And I am always of the, of the side of, you know, make it your own. Cause I always feel like I can make things better than you know, what I could buy. You know, so uh, I spent some time in Fusion 360 making my own, you know, K40Z table um, based off of one of Joe's ideas, which is making everything based off of CNC cut plates instead of something like extrusion or uh, angle brackets. So I have a really good design, I feel, that would work really well. Um, I need a, I'm, I'm about 90% there. And I'm trying to get some help on some of my uh, mechanical engineer friends at, at at our makerspace to kind of help me get the last 10% done because I'm only so good at fusion. And with the new baby, my time is very precious. And as much as I want to figure it out on my own, it'd be more more beneficial if I can leverage the experience of others to get it done quicker. So... I'm trying to get another another member on board to help me wrap it up super quick and kind of start getting that stuff, you know, cut so we can try it out sooner. So that's one project. Um, so I have the move, and then we have the laser table. And the third one, which has been ongoing uh, coincidentally since we had the baby, was a makerspace access control system, which is uh, allowing the makerspace to be able to control who has access to machines based on if they are safety certified on it or not. Um, the idea is it's kind of like a uh, RFID badge type system. And what it does is it will, it's a little standalone microcontroller system currently based off the ESP32 that I'm, I, I was doing it off the ESP8266, 82, but I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm trying to update it because it, it's it's just a newer version of it. But the idea is, you know, they scan a badge on the machine. The machine will actually query a local database to the makerspace. It will say, hey, is this user uh, qualified or certified to use this machine? Database says, well, yes, Aaron is certified to use the laser cutter. And the machine says, oh, well, if he's certified, I'll go ahead and activate the relay to allow power to the machine and allow the machine to be turned on. Um, after that, it also has the capability to measure the current and voltage of the machine as well as time so it can see uh, which user is using which machine for how long each month. Um, and the main use case for this was, you know, as a nonprofit makerspace, we have issues figuring out where should we allocate funds to as far as machine maintenance. We are only, you know, privy 
to what people tell us as far as how machines are behaving. And that is very biased towards whoever's the most vocal about the machines. Um, you know, one of my hypotheses was some of the more traditional makers using the wood shop, using the metal shop, aren't necessarily the most vocal as far as when things don't work as well or don't work at all. And they just kind of make it work or they just kind of hobble along. If those machines themselves could tell us, hey, you know, we're getting so much use each month. Currently, we don't have that visibility. It would be great for us to be able to say, hey, each machine is getting used so much each month. And then based on that sort of report, we can make better educated decisions on how to allocate the funds we get. So uh, based on the system, we'll be able to know who is using which, which machine for how long each month. And then from there, we can make really good decisions as far as allocating funds to maintenance or upgrades, new machines, and et cetera. So that's a very ambitious project that I have taken on. Um, I've, I, I made pretty decent progress before the baby came, but it's very much stagnated, you know, since then. So I'm trying to, uh, put myself in a place where I could delegate and kind of, you know, we have a lot of expertise within our microspace and I'm, I want to try and delegate that out. So it's not just on me because my time is very limited now. So, yeah, so the, those are my three projects that I'm uh, working on currently. No, that's awesome. I think uh, we all have a lot of things that we're shooting for right now and trying to accomplish. <laughs> um, I think it would be kind of a cool thing for us to be able to, every time that we do one of these, give a little bit of an update as to where we are in each one of those, almost like a little bit of an accountability to continue to keep making things awesome yeah. um, and be able to just get in there and actually be like motivated again. Um, cause that's one of the things that we talked about last time was, uh, getting to that finishing point and finishing the projects that we're working on. And one of the main things that we wanted to talk about this time was, uh, failure. And Joe wanted to kind of talk a little bit and, uh, his experiences and kind of give some light to that topic. Uh, so Joe, what, did, what were you kind of thinking about with that? Well, like, so the, um, the whole idea of failure seems to be a constant barrier to entry for new members and even existing members and um, new makers that I meet as I, I'm traveling around. I spend a lot of time going to uh, maker fairs and uh, other uh, events where I talk to people and you know, I hear a lot of like, well, you know, I'd really like to get into doing Arduino programming, but you know, I just don't know where to get started. And I just don't think I'd make anything very good. So I just, I'm just not going to do that. Or another one I hear a lot is I'd really love to get into 3D printing, but I just don't think I'm smart enough. So I'm just not even going to do it. And we just read that on Thursday. From yeah. A new perspective member. Yeah. And it, it drives me nuts because it's like, do you think that I knew what I was doing when I started any of this. And right. I, another one I hear a lot is, well, you you went to school for that. I didn't, I went to school for statistics, which I'm <laughs> bad at, by the way, really, really bad at. So, um, you know, when, when people are like, well, well, you went to school for the, the robot stuff. No, I tried and I failed a lot and every time i failed i learned and i i took the the lessons that i learned from the failures and i applied them to the next attempt that was a very solid chance i failed at again but then i applied those lessons again and throughout all of those failures i became successful at failing and eventually i succeeded at what i was trying to accomplish and River City Labs as a whole has been a giant experiment and failure. Um, 
you know, we we started the makerspace. None of us knew what we were doing. Uh, hadn't been part of a makerspace. Uh, we had one member that had been part of a makerspace, and he was uh, instrumental in the early guidance of like, here's what I think we should do. You know, but overall, um, his experiences were very different than what we needed to do for Peoria because it was for a much larger city uh, where he was part of a makerspace before. So. You know, we were constantly you know, trying out new things and failing and working towards this dream of one day we would have a functional maker space and uh, we're close to it now, four years later. Um, but th- this, this podcast is an example of um, not letting the fear of failure be a uh, barrier to entry. You know, all of us, I don't think any of us have done a podcast before. Uh, we spent the last week and a half researching what we should do and coming up with a reasonable plan of attack of how we're going to record this thing because we're recording it remotely. All of us are at our own houses right now because uh, we're insanely busy. So getting three of us in the same location on a regular basis is impossible. We um, had a failure just right before we started. Yeah. Today too. Yeah. Um, you know, we, it, Aaron's running Linux for everything, uh, which is awesome. Uh, but you know, we didn't realize that the sound drivers in Linux would only let one application access his microphone at a time. You know, so now we know, and we're going to apply <laughs> that lesson going forward and spend a little bit of time trying to get a workaround working. And, you know, it will just make us better. Um, you know, I there's a solid chance this will be the only podcast we ever do because we're just busy and you know, have the attention spans of squirrels. So, yeah, uh, there'll, there'll be more. This is super fun. <laughs> this has been a real. There will a, at a least be an attempt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's the point, though. Like we are attempting, regardless of whether or not we're going to fail. Um, and, and that's my biggest thing is it, you didn't fail if you tried, um, if your project didn't meet your goals or your expectations or, or you know, the perfect dreams that you had in your head, it's fine because you, you tried and there wasn't a second of what you were doing when you were trying where you weren't gaining new skills and new, um, you know, whatever you, 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 you were gained all of that. Sorry. My eloquence is draining apparently, <laughs> um, to be able to try again, you know, whether it's the same exact project, like you, your printer that you first built, built, made squiggly lines and garbage. And you know, now you're going to take the, those, uh, lessons that you learned from the first one and apply them to your second one that makes the perfect octopus. Um, I've printed octopus on my desk. I'm staring at, or, you know, the arcade machine that, you know, the next one will have a clamping mechanism to make sure your CO2 bottle doesn't fall. over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I was what, behind what, you that day. And that, oh, that dude. was so fun. So funny. It was it was something. I didn't realize how I, much danger you were in, so I was laughing hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> it was man, it was like a rocket was going off in the back of there, that's for sure. Oh totally, yeah. That's that's uh <laughs> yeah. I think um because I am I and I know Aaron we all are. We all are super geeks and super nerds. Uh, and I think what I always equate failure to is portal. Um, <laughs> portal is like the greatest tool to teach you that failure is not the end point. Oh, failure gosh. is just another step of learning, like how to complete it. Um, and it's, it's such an easy thing to be like, yeah, you never went through on like the end levels of portal and were able to get it on the first try. Yeah. Like nobody did that. And so it's, it's learning from your mistakes of, okay, well now I need to do that better next time. And now I need to do that. And eventually, I'm going to be able to get that cube and the damn button and I'll be able to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, 
someone pointed out a really good example of uh, the ability to just try again to me a couple months ago. And uh, it was a, a good friend, Matt. And he was talking about how he wanted to start a after school program for skateboarding. And it wasn't because like skateboarding is awesome because skateboarding is awesome, but it was because um, the type of person that it takes to get good at skateboarding is a very specific type of skate of person because at no point do you succeed on your first try in skateboarding. You, you fail every time for the first 30 times of trying a new trick and a lot of those failures. That's pretty positive are painful. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. that, like, it, you know, as you get better way more than 30 times to do anything good on a skateboard. Yeah. I was in middle school. <laughs> right. But you kept trying because every time you got a little closer, you got a little closer, a little closer. And then finally you Ollie in like, Oh, yeah. it's such a great feeling. And then, you move on to the next thing, you ollie up a curb. And, you know, the first time you ollie up a curb is always horrendously painful because you hit the curb <laughs> and then you hit your your arm on the ground. Um, and you know, it, I, I never thought of it that way, but it really does. It takes a special type of person to just continuously throw themselves on the ground and get hurt and keep getting back up to try again. Um, and so skateboarding and like BMX and all of those things are really great teachers of failure is not the end. It's the beginning. Um, so yeah, that was, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about it, it. What do you consider a failure? Like you could say, well, I want to try and do an Ollie on a skateboard. You know, you could, you know, try it. 30, 60, 90 times and not do well, but it, I don't know, like it's more of when you see a failure, it seems negative and like I didn't do it the way it should do or I failed or, you know, maybe it needs to be redefined because now, you know, we're in a culture where we're seeing companies saying, oh, well, we want people to fail often and learn. You know, and fail often, fail yes. as quickly as you can, which kind of make, which definitely makes sense. Like, just try it and see what works and what doesn't. Right. As long as you learn from it, you know, figure out what did work and what didn't work, and then apply that to the next iteration. You know, maybe we maybe we need to work on redefining what failure is. Yeah. You know, maybe as long as you're trying, it's not considered a failure. You know, as long as you're trying, you're saying, oh, well, I didn't fail. I just learned another way not to do an ollie, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, like, like, from the very beginning, we have it beaten into us that failure is not an option. Like, there is there's even a grade in school from the very beginning that is failure. So, yeah. um, you know, you Thomas know, Edison learned, you know, a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. Yeah. Yeah, one of the one of the most brilliant people I know. Um, I I asked him w- one day. He's a chemical engineer. He's like, "What? How many formulations did it take you to get to this?" And I can't remember the number that he told me. Formulations, but it was like six hundred and ninety-seven formulations <laughs> over over like eight years to get to the perfect recipe to get to this perfect chemical that he was trying to develop, and like. That's incredible. That's a that's a level of perseverance that I have I've never experienced outside of this this one guy. And and he also makes also documentation. Yeah, yeah. He's documented the specific every one of, of those formulations. formulations. <laughs> how they failed, why they failed, how um you know every specific thing he's documented it. It's amazing. No, that's it, that really is. That's it's something that takes a certain kind of personality for someone to be able to endure failure, to be able to push past that and find the answer beyond that. Um, and I think that's something that we all try and push the people in our maker space to be able to do is to go beyond the failure and do awesome. 
Um, and that's just something that we wanted to be able to share with everybody is just, just do it already. Mm -hmm. You have all these ideas, you have all these things that you want to shoot for, just freaking do it. And that was, that was kind of the key point of wanting to do this podcast. And we kind of got caught in and of ourselves is like, we wanted to come up with all these ideas. We wanted to come up with these themes. We wanted to come up with like the cover art and all that. And that's awesome. We should eventually think about doing that if we do, but we got, we started to get so wrapped up in it that we had to remind ourselves Guys, we just need to sit down and do this. Yeah. We just need to actually sit down and start doing it because if we don't, we're going to get lost in the failure when it eventually happens. Yeah. And if we just continue, if we if we just hit that go button, if we hit that record button, then we will actually start doing this and who knows, maybe it will, but maybe it won't. And if it if it does it, if it does fail, we've learned a lot already. Yeah. It, it, the other thing is um sharing like it's is i'm gonna do the most basic edit on this possible and then we're gonna put it out there like whether you guys like it or not because we need to get into the flow of sharing this stuff but also we need to get into i i think the three of us are are, are really primed to set an example for the rest of our membership and anyone who follows our membership, which is seems to be quite a few people, um, a lot of people, there um, <laughs> that failure is okay to to share and to pass on. Um, there's a YouTuber that I really really enjoy following that he makes a video on every iteration of his projects whether they work or not. And a lot of times, you know, you watch like a, a 20 minute video of him trying to build a hover boat. And then at the end, the hover boat's on fire and he's just like, <laughs> well, that one didn't work guys. I'll see you next week. And, and, it, <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing. It, 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 I really appreciate his willingness to share his, his failures with the world because it, it shows everyone that we're all human. Um, and that we, you know, we don't always make the perfect thing the first time. Um, mm. And I think that's really, really important for people to grasp. Maybe not you guys. <laughs> <sighs> I called you a troll in the last podcast a lot. <laughs> for a reason. It is, it is apt, but not always the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like a good judge of this podcast and its time is uh, how far we've made it down our drinks. And uh, I've made it just about to the end of my drink. I don't know how you guys are feeling. I um, have a huge on. cup. I'll catch uh, up. My second one. I, <laughs> I pre-gamed this podcast in anticipation. So, Well... If you guys are, if you guys feel good about this, uh, I'm, I'm feeling good. I feel like we've covered a lot of topics. We've covered a lot of things that we wanted to chat about this night and uh, kind of going into some even heavier topics of failure and stuff like that. Um, do you guys have anything more else that you want to share? No, no, I, I think this is about perfect. This is a, awesome. a good first go of it. So if you guys enjoyed this, there's lots of ways to find River City Labs and the three of us actually on the internet. Uh, River City Labs Peoria on Facebook, pod or yeah, that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, RiverCityLabs.space is our website. Um, you know, let us know how you felt about this and uh, if you want to hear us ramble about more things. Yeah. Aaron, do you have anything left? Yeah, uh, we definitely want this to be a community-driven thing. This is just this podcast is just the three of us, you know, drunkenly spewing things out there. You know, if there's something that you know the audience wants us to talk about, or you know, has any feedback on, you know, try and get a hold of us and let us know what we can do to either improve or if you have any ideas on what we can talk about or anything, just you know let us know you know and we'll be happy to talk about it yeah and argue about it <laughs> awesome all right well 
Uh, this, I would say, would probably be uh, the first ever actual pilot episode of Makers on Tap. Uh, you have been listening to myself, Christian Papach, Joe Spaniard, and Aaron Peterson just talking it up while we drink our respected drinks as we go on through the week making cool stuff. So if you feel if you want to be able to see more of this or listen to more of this on your respected podcast listening apps or netcasting, uh, feel free to download more uh, and hopefully we'll be posting more to the place where you're actually listening from. So as we go into the week, uh, I think the only thing we can say is just keep making cool stuff and we'll see you on the next episode. Keep failing. Yeah, but but do it fast and cheap and... You yeah, know. fail fast and cheap, and as often as you can, can it, and you can. And I'm, I am two drinks in and learn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, have a good week, and hopefully, we'll see you on the next one. This has been Makers on Tap. Uh, have a nice one, and uh, we'll see you next time. See you next time. See you next time. See you next time.